Hey everybody, Michael Snyder, Worldwide Weather Watch. Today's March 9th and right now we are looking at South America and we've got lightning flashes overlaid here on the visible satellite imagery. You can see the Amazon River. This is the Amazon rainforest. Look at all these hundreds of thunderstorms ongoing. You see the sun starting to set across portions of South America. If you look really closely, you can see an outflow boundary racing across the landscape right there. It's bound to run into something else and probably kick off another few thunderstorms in those areas. So I, I find this quite fascinating here. It's, here because where I live up here in the Pacific Northwest and North America, we get lightning on a much lesser frequency than obviously a lot of places around the planet. So it's kind of fun to watch these thunderstorms here go off across uh, the uh, continent of South America. Now, if I take a look at the precipital water here, and I just kind of scroll through here over the next few days, if I scroll through fairly quickly, you can see kind of it looks like jello kind of little wavy activity going on in that precipitable water. Those are gravity waves and outflow boundaries from those thunderstorms. And I mean, you, lived a lot, you live along the equator and you've got the strong sun beating down on the landscape. You've got plentiful moisture. So basically you're almost looking at the bottom of a pot there. When you turn it on, you start to see those bubbles pop up. That is the convection. And that's the same process that happens with that convection that fires off these thunderstorms. So fun look at things there. Now looking across the entire planet, this is apparent temperature. Temperature. This includes wind chill. And if I put that into motion, something you'll almost immediately notice is what looks like a heartbeat kind of racing across the landscape there as I scroll through the days. You can kind of see it and it'll quicken up there as we get towards the end of the loop. But yeah, that is the those are the land masses heating up and cooling down during the diurnal and the nocturnal cycles. And you'll notice the oceans do not change that much because that water holds much more heat than those land masses. And you can also, if you look closely, you see that jelloy motion across the equatorial areas where the temperatures are warmest. That is that deep convection and those outflow boundaries racing back and forth from those decaying thunderstorms that just flow outward and then redevelop new thunderstorms along their boundaries. And also, if we look way up in the atmosphere, this is 200 millibars, about 39,000 feet. So you can see why uh, flight controllers or aircraft dispatchers, that's what I do for my day job for Alaska Airlines. You can see why we try to avoid some of these jet streams. For example, if you're going to Seattle to Anchorage or Japan or whatnot, and you want to try to find a better route, you kind of, you're looking and planning and trying to figure things out because obviously flying into a headwind like that is going to add a bunch of time. And at the same time, you're not flying a straight line here from Seattle to Japan on a map like this. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean here in a moment. But if we scroll through this, you can see some of these very strong jet streams. And if I scroll on in through about Thursday night, look at this one forming here right across Texas, across the southern USA there. That is the jet stream associated with our huge monster storm that's going to form as we go through the day Friday across the lower 48 states. I'm going to talk about some of that in more detail here. But again, now remember the jet streams there, and you can kind of see them flowing here as we go through a 15-day period uh, streaming from, again, uh, west to east across the planet. And then you can see the northern and some of southern hemisphere here also something i wanted to point out quite quick quickly here as well let's see if it shows it actually i won't do that this time because uh, i need to be looking at a different, different view but anyway i digress let's take a look so this is what the world looks like so if you are a flight controller you're going to japan or something for seattle you're going to be up here across the aleutians and you're going to be coming down over towards northern Japan here if you're going to Tokyo, for example. You're not flying across what it looks like on the other map. This is the stereographic view of the northern hemisphere there. So if you put that into motion, you can also see the jet streams across the northern hemisphere. And there's that very potent jet stream there emerging across some of the southern plains, helping to drive this deep mid-latitude cyclone back up and across the Great Lakes and off eventually into Canada as we go on in through this upcoming weekend. Now, on uh, that same, uh, keeping that in mind here, that deep trough here moving towards the west coast of North America, look at this gradient here. Look at this polar lobe. This is tropopause potem potem potential temperature. There's a tongue twister for you. The, 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 the air aloft here in, in the tropopause is much lower here versus much warmer across some of the subtropical regions. You can imagine this intense pressure gradient. That is why the jet stream is so strong there, and that's why this storm is going to be so dang right impressive as it moves out across the the planes as we go through the day Friday. Now, I mentioned this yesterday, Joint Typhoon Warning Center. They did uh, name these storms, or at least they put them on here on the Joint Typhoon Warning Center. I think it's Ive Yvonne or Ivone there. And then there's Jude. This one's moving over Mozambique. Going to cause some flooding concerns there. Reemerge and redevelop back over the water. Take another swing at Madagascar as well. 
Now, taking a look at the lower 48, because this is one of the biggest, baddest storms on the planet as we come up on in through this week. So we're looking at 5,000 feet, 850 millibars, and this is much warmer air than normal at 5,000 feet here across central portions of the USA. But look at this trough bearing down across the southwest, and it starts to emerge over the Rockies. And look at this mid-latitude cyclone just absolutely launching this warm air mass back up across the Great Lakes into Canada. We have pegged the scale. I mean, look at this moving all the way up towards the Hudson Bay. Very cold air behind that system. We're going to have very chilly temperatures and some developing snowfall, probably some blizzard conditions, winter storm warnings as this mid-latitude cyclone. Look at this massive yin and yang. You've pegged the scale almost on both sides of some very cold temperatures versus very warm temperatures, kind of the Earth's balancing act in motion here as we go on in through the upcoming weekend. That launches all the way up towards Greenland. Now, looking at two meter dew point here, so you don't get that severe weather unless you have some pretty decent moisture values in place. So get a little bump here with the kind of the closed low initially moving out across some of the plains, but the big storm is still back here. And look at this moisture advection out in front of this mid-latitude cyclone, bringing some of that deeper moisture out over, you know, you're talking about Arkansas, you're looking at Missouri and Illinois there. Some severe weather is indeed going to be setting up some very powerful winds with some rich gulf moisture out in front of that. This has trouble written all over it. And if we take a look at this mid-latitude cyclone, and we're going to put this into motion here. So there goes the first one, the closed low, but then the nasty boy back here across the West Coast emerges. Look at this 975 millibar beast out across Kansas. Severe weather would be in this quadrant. You can see back here there's freezing rain potential. You know, there's snowfall that's going to be accumulating all the way back up into Canada. And you can see the severe weather threat from anywhere from Wisconsin all the way back down towards Louisiana and maybe even back out over the Gulf as this low pressure center races back up across the region. And look at this cold front just extending all the way from the Hudson Bay all the way back down across the East Coast out over the Gulf of Mexico and then off the East Coast there as we go on in through early next week. Very impressive storm. And we looked at this yesterday. They didn't have any probabilities up there, but like I was talking about, there's day five and there is day six. So this is for Friday morning through Saturday morning. You can see almost from Chicago all the way back down towards Houston, that severe weather threat. They're still trying to fine tune these details. Great forecast discussion about day six here. Again, National Weather Service products are excellent. So, you know, give some thanks if you know anybody in the weather service out there. And then you can go to day seven and they've even got one down towards New Orleans, pushing up across Birmingham, Chattanooga and Nashville, Tennessee is right there. Um, so taking a look here really quickly at that system out here. Um, this is that storm, uh, Jude. So it is now making landfall again in Mozambique. So kind of interesting stuff here. World Meteorological Organization showing that system there. And this was in Portuguese last time. I said there's probably a way to change it here, but no doubt this is uh, winds and flooding concern associated with that storm. And if we look across the Indian Ocean, something interesting here. So I've got a 30-day running sea surface temperature anomaly map. And I want you to watch right here. You see that upwelling right there, that cool water that kind of came off to the south and east of Mac Madagascar. I believe that was from the previous tropical system, Honde. And those tropical systems are very good at bringing up some of that cold water from depth. There is the strong winds are stripping the warm water off the surface, and then you get replaced with the upwelling in the wake of that storm. So I believe that is what that is from. Somebody want, might check my timing on that. But yeah, that would make sense if that was from that previous tropical system. And now we've got Jude moving across the top of Madagascar on into Mozambique as we speak. Now, this is sea surface temperatures across the central equatorial Pacific Ocean. So you can see we got this warm water coming off the coast of South America. And this is over the last 30 days, this is really deep displaced a lot of this cooler water at the surface. We still have La Nina light conditions and the Southern Oscillation Index still pointing towards La Nina right now. But this may be short lived as we're really bringing some of this warmer water out across um, the coast of South America. But on the flip side of that also, I want to kind of draw attention to this as we go on in through February. There still is some colder water, water there as at, at the end of the month was still there. So that while it was warmer at the surface, there was still some of that cooler water below the surface there. So it might not be, uh, you know, out of the question that we get some of that cooler water starting to perk up there along the coast of South America as well. But, uh, you know, it, it has resembled, the atmosphere has been resembling La Nina at times, a lot of the season here, but, you know, on the weak side of things. 
And if we take a look there, this again was updated last uh, February 13th there. And um, this is showing that we have the potential to either be neutral, La Nina or El Nino. We really don't know right now. And you can kind of see how some of the models keep us down to the cooler side of things. And some things even say a, little, a nine, La Nina or an El Nino or a neutral. So we are kind of up in the air right now on what is to come. You can see the CFS latest forecast has us climbing slowly out of the La Nina there towards neutral conditions by the time we head towards next fall and then you can kind of see that kind of neutral pattern there um, this is the southern oscillation index it has been on the wane so when you're in this positive territory is there zero we are in positive right now but we've been on the decline but this positive area is usually usually representative of the walker circulation being in la nina conditions uh, you can see they do a daily contribution, a 30-day running average, and a 90-day running average. And there's the 90-day is the yellow dotted line. It has been on the decline. The 30-day, of course, has been dropping a bit more. But if those daily contributions start bumping back up, then, of course, it'll start to skew those averages as well. So that is what is known as the Southern Oscillation Index. It is directly correlated to the Walker circulation. Now, looking at previous La Ninas, you can see usually La Nina starts to show itself much earlier, uh, you know, even in late summer and early fall. This one got such a late start here that I wonder if this is going to end up being classified as a La Nina. You need, th uh, I think, five three-month running totals to be below negative 0.5 five or zero negative 0 0.5 or below and we're going to be very close here it'll be interesting to see what we classify this as but when it all is said and done it could be just kind of a chilly neutral pattern as well but we have been in la nina the pattern has been reflecting that so i kind of think we might just edge out and be in a very weak la nina when all is said and done and there are uh, El Nino climate impacts, for example. This is for December through February. You can see certain areas like the Pacific Northwest all the way up into Alaska, usually above normal temperatures, kind of warmer there. And you can see the cool and wetter along the Gulf states. Maybe into the southwest USA, you can see across the maritime continent and across South Africa, Australia. So <clears throat> El Nino and versus, excuse me, <clears throat> fog in my throat there. El Nino versus La Nina does have global impacts. And you can see those, uh, they, they generally lessen a little bit as you go through the summer months. And then on the flip side of that La Nina climate impacts, you can see the Pacific Northwest kind of getting that wet and cool, the unique combination there because of La Nina, it affects our climate quite a bit. But you can also see around the planet, other areas are dealing with cool, you know, wet, there are some warm and dry across the Gulf states as well and some cool and dry across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So, yeah, interesting stuff there. But, yeah, anyway, one more look at that. You can imagine you're looking down into a boiling pot and you see those bubbles just start to pop up after you've turned on the heat. That is the process of convection, and that is what is going on here across the uh, Amazon rainforest. And, again, outflow boundaries and lots of lightning going on out there as well. So I always find that fascinating to look at. But, anyway, let me know what you think of the new channel. Click like and subscribe if you would, and hopefully I'll do it another video here in the next day or two and I'll try to do them daily if I have time. So anyway, I will talk to you guys later.